Today I'm going to do playthroughs of Pokemon Yellow and Pokemon Red to see which game Gengar can beat faster. My rules for these playthroughs are listed in the description, so check them out if you're interested. I should say why I'm making another Gengar video, after all I did make Gengar vs Alakazam a long time ago. In that video, I played very poorly with Gengar, choosing to use Substitute as one of its main strategies in the late game, and this really slowed down Gengar's results. Also back then, I had a rule that prevented myself from using rare candies with the Pokemon that I was using, and this also slows the results down. So today, I'm hoping to put in some really good results with this ghost, and finally redeem it and myself after so long. When Pokemon Yellow was released, a lot of Pokemon received updates to their move pools, but that isn't the case for Gengar. It has the exact same learn set between both games. It starts with three ghost moves, Lick, Confuse Ray, and Nightshade. In Pokemon Yellow, when the rival battles me in the lab, I have to knock out his Eevee which has 21 hit points. By the way, all the NPCs have the exact same DVs or determinate values, essentially Generation 1's version of IVs. This means that all of their team members' stats are always the same, so this Eevee is always going to be a 5 hit with Nightshade, since Nightshade deals damage equal to its user's level. On the other hand, in Pokemon Red, this fight only takes 4 turns, and that's because all of these Pokemon have 20 or less health. The Bulbasaur and the Squirtle both have exactly 20 health, and the Charmander, which I'm choosing to face today, only has 19. In my challenges, I use the Universal Pokemon Randomizer to replace my starter, and I have to pick which starter to replace. That means that I did select which starter the rival would be playing through the game with. When I set out to do this challenge, I examined his final starters, and I didn't really think that Gengar was going to be particularly weak against any of them. After all, it has Thunderbolt, which you can use against both Blastoise and Charizard, and it has Psychic, which you can use against the Venusaur. However, because Gengar resists Grass-type moves, I felt the Venusaur would obviously be the easiest to face, and I want to give myself as much of a challenge as is possible in this first playthrough. In the end, I picked to go up against Charizard over Blastoise, just because then the rival also has Gyarados, which is incredibly powerful. Whereas the uh, Arcanine is, yeah, the Arcanine is not very good. Like, its move pool, it has like Ember in the final battle. And that's because all of the enemy movesets in red and blue are just the last four moves that that Pokemon would have learned by level up. In the case of Arcanine, it's a Firestone evolution, so it only starts with four moves one of which is Ember. However, that isn't the case in Pokemon Yellow, and the developers really went out of their way to assign Pokemon interesting movesets so that they could get around the weird quirks of the good AI that was programmed for both of these games. So with that first battle out of the way, now let's do a breakdown of Gengar, because this thing is a serious beast. For base stats, it has 60 HP, 65 attack, and 60 defense, with 130 special and 110 speed. That gives it a 21.48% chance to crit, because crits in Generation 1 are determined by the Pokemon's base speed. So 130 special is amazing, especially because this is used both offensively and defensively in Generation 1. Additionally, 110 speed means that Gengar is going to move first against basically every opponent. And the good doesn't end there because Gengar is part of the medium slow growth rate, and despite this sounding like it would be a bad thing, it's actually faster than the medium fast growth rate for most of the game. Only in the mid to late 60s does this growth rate finally slow down enough to be slower than the medium fast growth rate, so that also means that Gengar is going to level up very quickly during this playthrough. And if all of that wasn't good enough, I feel like I'm uh, making like an infomercial about Gengar, this thing also has the ghost type, which means it's immune to normal type attacks. Essentially in the early game, almost every Pokemon just has normal type attacks, so Gengar can't really take damage from anything. In Pokemon Yellow, the first Pokemon that can damage it is the rival on Route 22's Spearow, which knows Peck. However, I'm just going to bypass that battle entirely today, and that means the rival is going to choose to evolve his Eevee into Flareon today. After all, he makes this choice based on the outcome of the first two battles. So a win in the lab and a skip on Route 22 means Flareon. After that, I head into Viridian Forest, and here there are no Weedle in yellow. That means that Gengar can take no damage here again. After all, in Generation 1, Pidgey's Gust is a normal type move. Because I'm looking to beat the game as fast as possible, and because of Gengar's amazing stats and typing, I'm going to skip all of the optional trainers here. 
And while I do that, it gives me the perfect opportunity to talk about Gengar's move pool. As I mentioned before, it starts with three ghost type moves, Lick, Confuse Ray, and Nightshade. And then through level up, it only learns two more moves, Hypnosis and Dream Eater. Through TMs and HMs, it has access to a wide range of moves. I think the most notable among these are Mega Punch, Body Slam, Mega Drain, Thunderbolt, Psychic, and Rest. After Gengar defeats the mandatory bug catcher in Viridian Forest, it levels up twice to level 8. So that means Nightshade is going to be dealing 8 damage per turn against Brock. I skip healing in Pewter City, head to the gym, skip the Light Years Junior Trainer, and then I face Brock. Here's the thing about his team. The Geodude only knows Tackle in Yellow version, so it can't do anything to Gengar. Because Nightshade's doing 8 damage per turn and the Geodude has 29 health, it's ensured to be a 4 hit. After that he sends out Onyx, and there's a couple weird interactions here that I want to mention. Onyx can deal damage to Gengar because it has Bide, however Gengar is moving faster because the Onyx only has 23 speed and my Gengar has 25 speed. That means I can use a move that doesn't deal damage, in this case Confuse Ray, to just stall it out. And Confusion has a nice interaction with Bide because if the opponent is accumulating energy and it hits itself in Confusion, it cancels Bide entirely which we can see here. After that, one more Nightshade and self-inflicted confusion damage takes the Onyx out. Gengar levels up to level 11, and that's its first split. 3 minutes and 9 seconds is honestly a great time for this split in Pokemon Yellow. Now, let's see how Gengar can do in Pokemon Red. Now, there are a lot of differences between these two games in the early game, and the time advantage here is going to go towards Pokemon Red. That's specifically because in the lab with Professor Oak, there's actually less dialogue, so you can get through this sequence faster. Additionally, there aren't any potions in the Viridian City Pokemart in Pokemon Red, so I'm just going to skip that entirely and head straight into the forest. And on my way, the old man doesn't stop me to teach me how to catch Pokemon, which is mandatory in Pokemon Yellow. So again, I'm a few seconds faster because of that. Then in Viridian Forest, the encounter rate is actually lower. In Pokemon Yellow, it's 25% when you're walking through the grass, and in Pokemon Red, it's only 8%. Additionally, the tiles that have like the little star patch in the bottom right, they don't spawn any encounters. So if you walk in a very specific path, you actually only bump into a few tiles that can spawn encounters, and by doing this, I can prevent all wild encounters and get through the forest very quickly. Of course, there is a bit of a nuisance, which is the fact that the final bug catcher has a Weedle. This both means Gengar gains less experience from this fight, and it can also damage me with Poison Sting. However, both Ghost and Poison types resist Poison type attacks, so yeah, Gengar is taking like almost no damage from this thing. I knock it out, and I move on to Pewter City where Brock waits for me. So as I mentioned, Gengar gained less experience from the Weedle, and that means it's going into this fight at level 7 rather than level 8 like it was in Pokemon Yellow. And additionally, Brock is a lot tougher in Pokemon Red. You could say he's a, he's a lot harder. In this case, his Geodude is 2 levels higher, and that gives it access to the move Defense Curl. However, in this case, since Nightshade deals fixed damage and it doesn't actually interact with the opponent's defense stat, this doesn't matter. However, what does matter is the fact that it has more health, and that means that it takes 5 hits for Nightshade to take the Geodude out instead of only 4. So this is a place where Pokemon Yellow is slightly faster. Next, Brock sends in Onyx, and this one's level 14, so again 2 levels higher, which means I have to go through more health. However, in this case, it isn't quite enough health though, so Gengar is still going to take a 4 hit here. I will direct your attention, however, to Onyx's moveset. It has Tackle, Screech, and Bide. In yellow version, it was additionally given the move Bind, and Bind has a really weird interaction with Gengar and the Ghost type. Whenever it hits, it does no damage, however it plays the repeated turns and plays the animation, but just does no damage. So it's a huge time waste if Onyx actually used Bide in yellow. I was lucky in this case because it didn't, so that means both of these times are going to be quite comparable, however there is that risk present in yellow where there isn't that risk in red. Here Gengar manages to defeat Brock very quickly and clock in with a time of 2 minutes and 35 seconds. Wow, so this is a really fast Brock split. Um, yeah, very impressive. So because of all the small time saves in the early game, Gengar's off to a faster start in Pokemon Red. I head out onto Route 3 and here I have to do some PP management to ensure that I can knock out all of the trainer Pokemon. Because normal types are immune to ghost type damage, I can't actually hit them with Lick, so I have to save Nightshade for all of the Rattata here. 
Now you're probably thinking, but Nightshade is also a ghost type move, Scott. This doesn't make any sense. Well, yeah, uh, in Generation 1, because Nightshade is a fixed damage move, it can deal damage to every Pokemon, even Pokemon like Rattata, which should be immune to it. In this case, I choose to face the last rather than the bug catcher with four Pokemon. After all, knocking out four bug types right now is going to feel quite slow. So I can take out her two team members and then head back to Pewter City because that'll reset her positioning and allow me to get past her. However, in red version, I didn't stop at the Viridian City Mart, so I can make my Mart trip here and buy some Pokeballs. After all, it's going to be much harder to come by HM Mules in Pokemon Red than it is in Pokemon Yellow. So I need to prepare for that now. When I head back on Route 3, I actually bump into a Spearow when heading through this patch of grass, and that's really convenient because I can catch it with the Pokeballs I just purchased, and now I have my Flyer for the rest of the playthrough. By the way, catching a Spearow here is better than trying to catch a Doduo later by Celadon City, because Spearow is easier to catch. Next is Mount Moon. I pick up the rare candy, then I run into a Geodude, and I catch it because it can learn Strength and Dig, two moves that are going to be very useful throughout the playthrough. After that, I head down these stairs, and this is so that I can pick up the TM for Mega Punch. After all, Gengar really needs a move that actually uses its stats that isn't Lick. After all, Lick is pretty bad, it only has base 20 power. You'll notice in the top left that the power displayed is 30, and that's because this area of the overlay is calculating effective power, meaning it's factoring in any multipliers that apply to that move. So in this case, it's 20 base power times 1.5 because of the stab modifier. I know this isn't exactly how the damage calculation works, but it gives us a good estimate of how powerful each move is. At this point in the playthrough, Gengar is on minimum battles, and that's important because it's going to give us a very direct comparison between the two games, because there are some small differences in the trainers that I have to fight. In this case, in Pokemon Red, I have to fight this Rocket, which is going to give less experience than Jesse and James do in Pokemon Yellow. After I defeat him and the following Super Nerd, then I can make my Fossil choice, and of course today I'm going to pick the Dome Fossil, the uh, one and only Fossil. This is the correct choice. After I've made this incredibly impactful decision, I can move on to Cerulean City. Now for most Pokemon here, there's a choice. Should I face Misty or should I face the rival? But in Gengar's case, there really isn't a choice. Fighting Misty doesn't make any sense. Her lead Staryu has 41 health, and so I'll need level 21 to two-shot it with Nightshade. Additionally, her Starmie has 56 speed, so Gengar isn't going to move first against it yet. What makes much more sense is to fight the rival right now after collecting the rare candy. He leads with Pidgeotto, and like I said before, Gust is a normal type move in this generation, so the only move it can actually affect me with is Sand Attack. However, he doesn't have good AI, so he has no idea, and he'll just use whatever. In this case, he tries Gust twice, both which fail, and then he tries Quick Attack, and I knock him out with my fourth Mega Punch. Okay, so yeah, this fight's going really well. Next is Abra. Now let's take a look at the top left. Lick has zero power, and that's because in Generation 1, due to a programming error, Psychic types are immune to ghost type moves. So yeah, Lick is very useless. Still, the Abra's pretty weak, and I knock it out with two uses of Nightshade. Following that is Rattata, and it only knows normal type moves, so it's also free, and then he sends in Charmander. Now the only move it can hit Gengar with is Ember, but in this case it just chooses to go for Scratch, does nothing, and then I knock it out. Okay, so that was a really easy rival battle. With it out of the way and some excellent video editing, I can defeat all the trainers on Nugget Bridge, collecting experience as I go. After I defeat the Hiker, I pick up the Hidden Elixir, and then I feed this to Gengar so that it can continue going without having to head back to Cerulean City to heal. Now here I need to make a choice. Do I fight one additional Hiker and get the TM for Seismic Toss, or do I just skip it? Well in this case, both Seismic Toss and Nightshade function the same way, and because there's no type advantage for either of them because they're fixed damage moves, it only makes sense to skip this TM today, saving some time by doing one less battle. After defeating the last at the end of the route, Gengar is level 22 when it reaches Bill's house, so this ensures that I'm going to get the two hit against Misty's first Staryu. I save Bill from his freaky experiment, and then I use an escape rope to teleport back to Cerulean City. Now it's time to face Misty. She leads with Staryu. I didn't even heal going into this fight because I'm so confident against her Pokemon. In this case, I got a little bit ambitious and went for Mega Punch. After all, Gengar does have a really high chance to crit, and if I got one, I would knock out the Staryu in one hit. However, instead, I just miss, which is like, ah. Uh... I really should have started using Nightshade at this point, but I don't. I go for Mega Punch and I knock the Staryu out over two more turns. 
Gengar levels up to level 23, pushing it over a damage rounding threshold. By the way, when Pokemon level up from like level 22 to level 23, the damage they're dealing increases non-linearly. This happens at levels that end in 0, 3, 5, and 8. So now it's time to face the Starmie. Because Gengar has 65 speed, it easily outspeeds Starmie, which has 56 speed. I use Mega Punch, it does about a third, and Starmie strikes back with Bubble Beam, taking Gengar to orange. My next Mega Punch takes it to what looks like orange health, but I'm not sure if I'm gonna get the KO. It strikes back with Water Gun, and Gengar goes down to 18 hit points. My next Mega Punch takes it to red, and then it hits me with another Water Gun, and now Gengar's on red as well. Okay, this is, uh, this is way too close. It should not be this close. And then, my next Mega Punch misses. Okay, so this is the reason that I really should be using Nightshade here. <laughs> like, writing this script, I'm obviously aware of what the correct play is, but when I was playing the game, I was just really banking on the fact that I'm like, Gengar's gonna crit with Mega Punch and do so much damage. Ah, <laughs> oh, such a bad choice. Because of this, Starmie strikes back with Water Gun, and I was sure this was it. However, Gengar survives on one hit point. Okay, so this is so good. And then, because I've been playing a lot of Generation 3 and Generation 2 lately, I make the ultimate mistake. I choose Lick to finish the Starmie off, because I was thinking, this move has 100% accuracy. But in this case, it doesn't affect the Psychic type, and Starmie knocks Gengar out. Alright, well, uh, that's embarrassing, so I guess I have to do this fight again. Luckily in the next fight I get a critical hit against the Staryu and that takes it out in one hit. Starmie's next and in this case I still haven't figured out that I should be using Nightshade. Here's an interesting fact. Even though Gengar is getting an attack boost, its attack stat is low enough that Mega Punch is going to 4 hit the Starmie, whereas Nightshade would always 3 hit it. After all, Nightshade would do 69 damage if Gengar is level 23. And that would be really nice because then I would get the KO. However, in this case, things get close again. But at the pivotal moment, I don't choke and pick Lick, I choose Nightshade instead, and that's it for Misty. Although, I have to say, that was some rough play, I am very sorry everyone. So Gengar got an 11 minute and 30 second split against Misty in Pokemon Red. And from here, I think that things are really going to speed up for this ghost, because very soon it's going to drop moves like Mega Punch, and it's also going to get access to its first special move, because up until this point, its special stat has essentially been only defensive. And really the only Pokemon that deals special damage are Misty's Pokemon. Like yeah, there's like an Oddish and stuff, but let's not count that. I sweep through the Rockets team fairly easily. Now this could have been risky because the Drowsy knows Hypnosis and Confusion. Of course, Psychic type moves are super effective on Gengar because it also has the Poison type. With him out of the way, I get the TM for Dig, and this is why I caught the Geodude earlier, and then I head into the tunnel where I pick up the Full Restore. After all, this is very useful to heal status conditions whenever they occur. Now a trainer that regularly causes problems is this junior trainer who has three Pidgeys. All of them know Sand Attack. By the way, in Generation 1, when the opponent has a team of multiple Pokemon, all of them are the same level. So in this case, because moves are determined by the natural moves that that Pokemon would know at a certain level, that means all of these Pokemon have the exact same movesets. The worst thing here is just missing endlessly, however in this case they only have normal type moves, so Gengar really doesn't have to fear. I knock out all of her birds, and then before I move on to the SSN I have to do one more errand, and that's to catch myself an Oddish so that I can use Cut. By the way, today I'm playing Pokemon Red, uh, mostly because it's more marketable, but actually in Pokemon Blue you can catch a Sandshrew just before Cerulean City, and this Pokemon is a much better HM mule than say Geodude and Oddish, because the Sandshrew itself can learn Cut, Dig, and Strength. However, it isn't that much of a time loss to pick up the Oddish. After that, I pick up some Repels in Vermilion City and then I head to the SSN. Here, because Red Version is a lot easier than Pokemon Yellow, I'm going to skip the TM for Rest. After all, Gengar has access to Recovery through moves like Dream Meter and Mega Drain anyways. The first room that I visit is the room with Body Slam, and I am really happy to have a 100% accurate move to use now with Gengar. And then the second room I visit is the one with the Gentleman and the Rare Candy. Now this is only the second optional trainer that I fought in this entire playthrough. And because this is my first playthrough with Gengar in Pokemon Red, I want to be as safe as possible. Being slightly underleveled for the League or something like that, it just doesn't feel good today, so I'm going to pick up this item just in case. After that I save, and then I fight the rival. Still Pidgeotto has no moves that can damage Gengar, luckily it doesn't go for Sand Attack and I take it out with two Body Slams. Next is Raticate. It can't damage me so I take it out for free and move on to the Kadabra. Now this thing does have Confusion and it could do a lot of damage, however look at Gengar's speed, it's 73. This Kadabra only has 45 speed, <laughs> so I just move first and knock it out with Body Slam. Last is Charmeleon, and in this case it could damage me with Ember, 
which it actually does, but it does pathetic amounts of damage due to Gengar's massive special stat, and then I knock it out. Just in case you're a new viewer to the channel, my front end that is displaying all these stats is also able to modify the game in real time while I play, and so in this case it solves the trash can puzzle for me so that no RNG enters into the results that these Pokemon get. That allows us to compare the times more directly without any randomness. I heal up, which is uh, pretty good because sometimes I forget to do this, and with that, I'm ready to face the Electric Master. In Pokemon Red, he has a team of three instead of just a team of one. However, as a consequence, the Raichu is actually four levels lower than it is in Yellow. Additionally, the Voltorb is pretty useless, it doesn't even have an electric type attack. However, even though Sonic Boom is a normal type move, it deals fixed damage so it is able to damage Gengar, and this happens first turn. But Body Slam is doing enough and I knock it out on the second turn. Okay, Pikachu's next. Now, it could use Thundershock or Thunder Wave, which would be particularly bad because it would paralyze me and cut my speed. However, Body Slam just one hits it, so yeah, that's it. Next is his ace, Raichu. I go for Body Slam, it does what looks like half, and then Raichu strikes back with Thundershock, which does very little. Unfortunately, I am out of PP for Body Slam now, so I have to go for Nightshade, which doesn't quite finish the Electric-type mouse off, and it hits me with a Thunderbolt as a result. Still, Gengar shrugs it off and knocks it out the next turn. So Gengar clocks in with a time of 15 minutes and 24 seconds against Surge. This is an absolutely exceptional performance. Gengar right now is on track for an S-Class performance, as it should be. With the first three gyms out of the way, I think we need to switch back over to Pokemon Yellow to get some comparisons. Right after defeating Brock, I make a mistake with Gengar because I head out onto Route 3 right away. I was hoping that Lick's power points would be enough to get me through the route, but then I realized I needed enough Nightshades to knock out the normal types here, and as a result I waste a little bit of time. On Route 3 I don't run into a flyer, which is a bit unfortunate because Gengar hasn't caught its flyer yet. It was unlucky and didn't get one in Viridian Forest. Then, inside of Mount Moon, I don't have to catch any additional Pokemon, so I can just skip all of the Geodudes today. I pick up the rare candy, grab the TM for Mega Punch, and teach it to Gengar right away. On the bottom floor, I defeat the Super Nerd and pick up the Dome Fossil, of course, and then I have to face Jesse and James. So going into the rival battle on Nugget Bridge, the yellow Gengar is actually one level higher just because of the mandatory experience it's gained over Pokemon Red. However, that doesn't really matter for the rival fight because this battle is so easy for a ghost type. Like, look at the movesets he has. So, Peck is the only damage dealing move that can hit Gengar, and outside of that, the Sandshrew can hit me with Sand Attack, which would be very annoying, and then Rattata can hit with Tail Whip, and the Eevee can hit with like all of its status moves, but yeah, it's not going to defeat us. So, Gengar takes an easy victory today. Once again, I defeat all the trainers on Nugget Bridge, and then after saving Bill from his freaky experiment, I can't actually use an escape rope to get back to Cerulean City. This was patched out in Pokemon Yellow, so I have to walk back to the city. This wastes an additional 5 seconds. Then I head to Misty's Gym and defeat the Goldian Trainer, and after that Gengar's level 23. Okay, I'm ready to defeat the Water-type Master. This time, I'm not going to be using Lick. But I am still going to be going for Mega Punch. Still, it lets me take the Staryu out in two turns. Against Starmie, I'm still using Mega Punch, and as you can see, it takes four hits. However, Gengar still manages to take the victory. Alright, I promise in my second playthroughs I'm going to figure that one out and use Nightshade instead. The rocket outside of town isn't troublesome, Gengar takes an easy victory, and then I head to Vermilion City. There's a small time save here for Pokemon Yellow because I don't have to pick up the Oddish, and I head straight into the SSN. Now normally I pick up the TM for rest with the Pokemon I'm running, especially in Pokemon Yellow, however today I'm going to skip it with Gengar, instead I go straight for Body Slam, I do pick up the rare candy fighting that gentleman, and then I face the rival. Now when I compare games, it's sometimes very obvious which team is harder, and theoretically in Pokemon Red his team here on the SSN is much more difficult, after all the Kadabra could mess Gengar up with confusion, however in practice, that isn't really the case, like both of these teams are just very bad. Gengar takes an easy victory, and now it's time to face Surge. In Pokemon Yellow, he only has one Pokemon, it's a Raichu, and he also lost his good AI, which means he's going to use moves like Mega Punch and Mega Kick against Gengar. Just great. In this case, my first Body Slam gets a critical hit, taking Raichu under half health, and it also causes paralysis. So yeah, that's like the best possible first turn. Still, Raichu is able to move and it uses Thunderbolt, which does a decent amount to Gengar. I didn't heal going into this fight, so mm, yeah, that's another mistake for me. My next Body Slam doesn't quite knock the Raichu out, and Surge goes for an X speed. In this case, Raichu does outspeed Gengar on the next turn, but it just goes for Growl, and then my Body Slam knocks it out anyways. 
Okay, so that is a first attempt victory against Surge for Gengar in yellow. It clocks in with a time of 15 minutes and 12 seconds. So now let's do a brief comparison of how the early game went for Gengar in both of these games. Against Brock in Pokemon Red, Gengar was faster by 34 seconds. And then against Misty, it dropped a little bit of its time lead and was only faster by 24 seconds. However, if I didn't have my silly reset with Lick, this time would have probably been more like 50 seconds to a minute. Against Surge, however, Gengar is now faster in Pokemon Yellow by 12 seconds. I'd say the major contributing factors here are the fact that Gengar needed to catch an Oddish in Pokemon Red, and also the fact that Lieutenant Surge's team is just faster to get through in Yellow because he has fewer Pokemon. Additionally, of course, the mistake against Misty doesn't help my time in Pokemon Red, but still, these times are only 12 seconds apart. It's very close at this point. After grabbing the bike voucher and then Squirtle, I have to head to Diglett's Tunnel to dig back to Cerulean City. After all, I cannot use Dig inside of the Pokey Fan Club in Pokemon Yellow, however I can in Pokemon Red. Now remember that interaction between Bind and Ghost types that I mentioned? Well, the Wrapping Lass also has the potential to do that to Gengar, because if the first Oddish cuts Gengar's speed, then the second Bellsprout can use Wrap and just actually waste time, like it will do no damage, there is no possibility for her to win, but it's certainly going to be frustrating if that happens. Luckily, the first Oddish doesn't paralyze me, and I'm able to get through her whole team without a delay. Next is the Pokemaniac, and this guy could be very scary for Gengar because he leads with Cubone, and it has Bone Club, which is a ground-type move. Because Thunderbolt doesn't affect a ground type, I have to use Body Slam. It does more than half, and then Cubone strikes back with Bone Club, dealing one-third to Gengar. Okay, that's good. I knock it out on the next turn, and next is Slowpoke. Here I'll mention that Thunderbolt is actually going to be Gengar's most powerful move throughout this entire playthrough. In Generation 1, it has 95 power, and this gives it a 5 power advantage over a move like Psychic. It one-hits the Slowpoke, and that's that. Now to this point in my routing, I've been very careful which moves I've learned over which other moves. I replaced Mega Punch with Body Slam, and then I replaced Lick with Thunderbolt. This is because I needed to preserve Nightshade so that I can use it to get through the self-destructing Hiker a little bit faster. After all, Thunderbolt does nothing to his Pokemon, and Body Slam is going to take a long time to knock them out. Obviously, the fastest way that I could win here is if they all just self-destruct on the first turn. And uh, that's one self-destruct on the first turn from the first Geodude. And uh, then the second one goes for it as well. Okay, will the Graveler be three for three? <laughs> yes, it will be. So that's that. That was a very fast battle in Pokemon Yellow. And with that out of the way, Gengar can proceed to the mid game. So in Celadon City, I have a choice to make. Do I explore the hideout, pick up some extra items, and grab an extra rare candy, or do I head straight to the department store? For Gengar, because it's such a beast, I'm going to the department store right away. I pick up my typical 10 repels, pick up the counter TM, which is free, grab two polka dolls, and then I head to the top floor. By the way, if I'm going to buy three vitamins, I'm going to have to grab one additional TM. In this case, I pick up the TM for Ice Beam because it takes the least number of clicks, and then I sell it so that I can buy three vitamins. In this case, because Gengar is so fast, I pick up Calcium because this will improve both its special attack and special defense. They're a unified stat in Generation 1. Because I haven't caught a flyer yet in Pokemon Yellow, I have to pick up a Doduo here, which takes some time, and then I fly back to Celadon City. Now, I'm going to make a choice here, which is to go to Saffron City immediately to pick up the TM for Psychic. When I was making this video, I talked with Speedrunner0218, who was the victor of my Porygon race challenge back in March. He also made a Gengar video in Pokemon Yellow, and so we discussed strategies as to the best way to route Gengar. I have to give him credit because he gave me a lot of ideas about how to do this playthrough, but one thing that he didn't choose to do was grab Psychic as early as I want to get it. I'm doing this specifically because having this move means that I'll have super effective damage against the Ghastlies in Pokemon Tower, which are following. They are known for being very trolly because they can use Lick to paralyze you and then Confuse Ray to confuse you. Parafusion is just awful and I want to avoid it today at all costs. However, before I fight the Ghastlies, I have to fight the rival. Now, let's reflect on Gengar's moveset as it stands right now. I've taught Thunderbolt, Hypnosis, Psychic, and Body Slam. At this point, I'm feeling really good about this moveset, and I'm not sure I'm even going to need any new moves throughout the entire playthrough. These moves give Gengar good answers to all the rival's Pokemon, and then, against the Ghastly, I'm able to one-hit all of them. At the top of the tower, Gengar defeats Jesse and James, and at the end of this fight, it levels up to level 33. Okay, so that'll be relevant later when we compare this with Pokemon Red. I wake up the Snorlax, pick up a rare candy, grab the PP up, this'll be useful for Psychic, and then I head into the Safari Zone. 
Here I collect three optional items, which are very standard in my playthroughs, the Carbos, the Full Restore, and the Protein. After that I teach Squirtle Surf, use the Vitamins, and then dig back to Celadon City. Now I head to Erica's gym, and I'm going to only choose to fight the one mandatory trainer here with an Execute. And at this point, I should probably talk about Hypnosis, because most of you are going to be very worried now that it's on my moveset, because I'm known for, uh over-relying on this move, should we say, and producing very bad results for the Pokemon that I'm running as a consequence. While Generation 1 sleep is very broken, it can last an incredibly long time and the Pokemon doesn't get a chance to attack the turn it wakes up. This is a double-edged sword for Gengar because Hypnosis only has 60% accuracy, and believe me, in these games it feels like 25% accuracy. I solemnly swear not to overuse this move today. Do not worry, I'm slowly learning the lesson that this is not a good move. In this case, Hypnosis is actually useful because this Execute knows Hypnosis as well. And this Cool Trainer also has good AI, so she's only going to use either Hypnosis or Reflect because Gengar is a poison type. So I want to make sure that I get Hypnosis first. If I was put to sleep, a lot of time would be wasted with the Execute just spamming Reflect over and over and me waiting to wake up. After I put it to sleep, I knock it out, and now I can face Erica. She leads with Tangela, and this thing is honestly very bulky. However, Psychic does nice damage, and I was surprised by this. The Vine Monster strikes back with Vine Whip, and it does so little. Then, after surviving my second Psychic, Erica uses a Super Potion, which is very rare for her in yellow. And this really delays things because I need to use two more Psychics to knock it out. So I only have two PP left for her following two Pokemon. Luckily in Generation 1, most Grass types are paired with the Poison type. And in the case of Weeping Bell and Gloom, this is the case. So Psychic's super effective and I knock the Weeping Bell out in one hit. Okay, it's time for the Gloom. I roll Psychic again, and in this case it doesn't do quite enough damage. If you're really attentive, you'll notice that the Weaving Bell and the Gloom have the same special stat. So yeah, I just rolled bad damage this time. Erica uses a Super Potion. I have to use Body Slam because I'm out of Psychic PP. It doesn't do quite enough, and then Gloom paralyzes Gengar. However, she doesn't have a good option now. Like, Sleep is off the table now because I'm paralyzed, and it can only use Petal Dance or Acid. It goes for the former, but Paralysis doesn't prevent me from moving, so that's it. I've defeated her. Gengar clocks in with a time of 25 minutes and 43 seconds against Erika. However, will the Gengar have maintained its lead in Pokemon Yellow over Pokemon Red? Let's find out. One difference between the two games is that in the Pokemon Fan Club, I can use Dig to head directly back to Cerulean City. After all, there's no Squirtle to pick up in Pokemon Red. I grab the bike, teach Thunderbolt, and then head out onto the route, hoping that the wrapping lass won't slow me down. After all, she's the same between both games. In this case, the Oddish does go for Stun Spore, but luckily it misses, so Gengar gets past the first Oddish without any issues. However, the second one could paralyze me, but in this case it just uses Absorb, and so that's a quick victory for me. The Pokemaniac's Cubone is similar, doing a lot of damage, but not enough to knock me out, and then I Thunderbolt the Slowpoke for an easy win. Now it's time for the Self-Destructing Hiker. Funnily enough, all of his rocks, no rock throw, so they can actually deal damage to Gengar. I forgot this when going into the fight, so I didn't heal, and as a result, I get taken to orange by the first Geodude. That's not good. However, the second one just tries a tackle and I knock it out with a second Nightshade, and then the Graveler self-destructs, so that's an easy victory for the red Gengar. And with it, it's made it to the mid-game. Now in red and blue, I think that going into the rocket hideout is almost always a waste of time. So I skip it, head straight to the department store, and I still buy calcium here. I pick up Psychic, teach it to Gengar, and then I face the rival in Pokemon Tower. Now I mentioned on the previous rival fight that I wasn't sure which team was stronger, the team in yellow or the team in red, but in this case, the team in red is significantly stronger than the team in yellow. After all, in the place of Shelder, he has Gyarados, which has Hydro Pump. Yeah, that thing's a beast. He also has Kadabra with Confusion, Execute, which has Hypnosis, so it could be very annoying. Also, his Pidgeotto has Sand Attack still, like, ah. However, because Gengar's moveset, it's not going to struggle against any of these Pokemon, and I managed to defeat him with ease. Now, I want to remind everyone about my Nidoran race with Van Man, where he played Pokemon Red and I played Pokemon Yellow. Now, in that video, I tried to be as exhaustive as possible discussing major differences between Pokemon Yellow and Pokemon Red. However, I realize now that I missed one of them, and that's the fact that you have to fight more trainers on the top floor of Pokemon Tower. I think I mentioned this, but I didn't mention why this is important. Because in Pokemon Red, you actually gain more experience through all these battles, which are mandatory. 
I mentioned that in Pokemon Yellow, Gengar is level 33 after defeating Jesse and James at the top of the tower, but after defeating all the mandatory trainers here in Pokemon Red, Gengar is level 34. So now it has one additional level advantage over the Pokemon Yellow Gengar. However, it did have to invest slightly more time doing that because there were more battles. With the tower out of the way, I follow the same routing that I did with Yellow, and all that leads me to Erica's gym. I defeat the mandatory execute trainer as well, and now I'm ready to take on the grass master. Her team in Pokemon Red is significantly different from her team in Pokemon Yellow. She has final evolved Pokemon here, however they're lower levels. As a result, their stats are very comparable between the two games, meaning there isn't really much of a difference between Erica in Yellow and Erica in Red. It can be really annoying for Victory Bell to get crits with Razor Leaf in this game, however today it doesn't matter because Gengar is going to sweep easily with Psychic. In this case, the fact that Ortangela is a significantly lower level makes things faster for Gengar. It is the first instance where we see a Pokemon using a trapping move that hits Gengar. Well, it doesn't hit Gengar, it just like traps Gengar, wastes time, and then I knock it out with a second Psychic. After that, it's time for Vileplume, and uh, this sprite, please, just this sprite is so bad. Oh, I hate it. <gasps> After that, I use Psychic, and the Vileplume survives just like the Gloom did in Pokemon Yellow. However, I haven't run out of PP in this case, and I knock it out on the next turn. Gengar levels up to level 35, and then I've defeated Erika. It gets a time of 25 minutes and 23 seconds. So how does that compare? Well, the Pokemon Red Gengar is now 20 seconds faster than the Pokemon Yellow Gengar. That is a 32 second swing in this section of the game. One factor leading to this discrepancy is that in yellow I can't dig out of the Pokey fan club and I have to pick up Squirtle, so there's some lost time there. I also did have to catch my flyer in Pokemon Yellow, which I didn't have to do in Pokemon Red. So right now it feels like this race is very back and forth, like they're in lockstep with each other. There haven't been any major hurdles for either of them to face. However, that's all going to change very soon, because next is Koga. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that in Pokemon Red, I think that the jugglers in his gym are actually stronger than Koga. Like, they have psychic types that are pretty tanky, like the drowsy are just hard to knock out. Luckily, I'm able to get through all of them with Gengar and move on to Koga himself. So let's go over his team in Pokemon Red. Yeah, they're all poison types in this case, he's got a coughing, a muck, another coughing, and a wheezing. Probably the scariest move on this entire team is his wheezing's self-destruct, especially in a solo challenge where if it self-destructs you basically lose, but in this case that's a normal move so it can't even hit Gengar. My psychic doesn't knock the muck out in one hit, but then its best move is just sludge, and yeah, Gengar takes like almost no damage from this. I knock it out on the next turn, level up to level 37, knock the coughing out in one hit, and now it's time for wheezing. I go for psychic, it doesn't quite KO, taking it to orange health, and then Koga uses self-destruct. Thank you so much for speeding up that victory for me. So I defeat Koga like a minute and 20 seconds after I defeat Erika. Gengar in Pokemon Red gets a time of 26 minutes and 45 seconds. Well that was a dominant performance for Gengar in Pokemon Red, but it's going to be different in Yellow. After all, Koga is probably the trainer that was changed the most between these two games. Because I'm anticipating him being quite powerful, after all, all of his bug type Pokemon have psychic moves in this game, I use rare candies before the fight, leveling Gengar up to level 40 over the next damage rounding threshold. Alright, I hope that this is going to be enough, now let's do it. I'm hoping for a one hit against his first Venonat, I use Psychic and it gets it due to a critical hit. Alright, I'm not sure if that's inspiring or if I'm more concerned about his following Venonats. I go for Psychic against the second one, crossing my fingers again, and it gets the KO. No critical hit this time, alright that's good. Will the third one be a one hit as well? Well, yes it will, but because of a critical hit. Alright, this is pretty lucky. Last is Venomoth, and this Pokemon's typing is Halloween themed, so it's going to be hard for Gengar to deal with. I go for Psychic, it does more than half, and then Venomoth strikes back with its own Psychic, which does about half to Gengar. Okay, I'm going to be able to knock it out the next turn, so that's it. Koga actually ended up being easy, but I'm glad I used the rare candies here. That probably gave me the two shot on the Venomoth and the one shot on the Venonat, at least the second one. So Gengar gets a time of 27 minutes and 38 seconds in Pokemon Yellow. 
Comparing these times, it's clear that the red Gengar is starting to get an advantage. It's now 53 seconds faster than the yellow Gengar. Now if you're familiar with my Pokemon Yellow playthroughs, you'll think that there's a choice here. Do I go to Sylph or do I surf to Cinnabar Island? But in Pokemon Red, that really isn't the case. I have to obtain Lapras to use Surf. Yes, I could pick up the good rod and then catch myself a surfing Pokemon and then surf to Cinnabar Island, but all of that is going to waste extra time. So instead, I'm going to head to Sylph next and try and pick up Lapras, and that means I have to defeat the rival. However, Gengar's just under a damage rounding threshold when it levels up to level 38. I'm probably going to be doing enough damage. I'm hopeful about that fight. On the 10th floor, I face the Machoke Rocket. After all, I really want the Carbos and Rare Candy that he's blocking. After that, I go downstairs, pick up the Calcium, and then I face the Arbok Rocket, and the experience from this fight levels Gengar up to level 38. After that, I grab the Card Key, and now I'm ready to face the rival. He leads with Pidgeot. Honestly, its moveset is pretty awful, I just hope I don't get hit by Sand Attack. I use Thunderbolt, and it takes it out in one hit. Okay, that's good. Next is Execute. Now because he has good AI, this thing is only going to use Reflect, so I really don't need to be worried here. I go for Body Slam, it does half with a critical hit, Execute sets up Reflect, and I'll just mention here that this doesn't actually apply to the opponent's entire team in Generation 1. It only boosts the defense of the Pokemon that's currently on the field. When it switches out, the Reflect is gone. I get another critical hit with Body Slam knocking the Execute out, and then Gyarados hits the field. Obviously here, Thunderbolt does 4 times damage, so I take it out in a single hit, and then Alakazam comes out. Okay, I have to be very careful against it, because its Psybeam is going to do so much damage to Gengar. I try for Hypnosis to put it to sleep so it can avoid damage entirely, however, it strikes back with a Psybeam, gets a critical hit, and does so much. Ugh, it also confused me? Are you kidding? This is going to be a loss. Gengar hits itself, and Alakazam finishes me off on the next turn. On my next fight, Hypnosis works, and it puts the Alakazam to sleep. I go for Body Slam next, and it does more than half. Alright, that makes me think maybe I should have just gone for Body Slam right away and tried to tank one Psybeam. I take it out on the next turn, and then he sends in his ace, Charizard. Obviously Thunderbolt is super effective here, so I use it and I hope for the one hit. But it doesn't quite get it. However, Charizard can only hit me with Ember. It does so little and I knock it out on the next turn. The prize for that fight is Lapras. I pick it up, and then I make quick work of the following Rocket and Giovanni. Now I could surf to Cinnabar Island, but that won't save the most time. Instead I want to go to Copycat's house and pick up Mimic, and then fight Sabrina. After all, once I defeat her, I won't need to come back to Saffron City again. In Pokemon Red, she leads with Kadabra. Overall, her team is quite different. She has four Pokemon instead of three, but they're all lower levels, which means I'm going to outspeed everything, even the Alakazam. My Gengar has 132 speed, by the way, and this wouldn't outspeed Sabrina's Alakazam in Pokemon Yellow, so I'll need to be a higher level for that fight. But in this case, this speed is more than enough. I make it through her first three team members without taking any damage. Alright, this is really promising. I use Body Slam, it does more than half to Alakazam, and then it strikes back with Psybeam. Oh my, that did so much damage, are you kidding me? Oh, it takes Gengar out. Alright, so that was a critical hit. Um, she's not going to get that lucky in the next fight. Well, actually, I'm not going to get that lucky. I'm actually just going to play bad. I accidentally use Thunderbolt on the Kadabra, and it does less than half. I switch to Body Slam, but that means Gengar's taken almost half damage by the time Mr. Mime comes out. My first Body Slam does half, Mr. Mime sets up Barrier, and then my next one doesn't knock it out. As a result, it gets a Confusion. This takes Gengar down to orange health before Venomoth hits the field. Ah, uh, this is really not going well. Luckily, my Psychic takes this thing out in a single- Oh, it doesn't. The Venomoth survives. Are you kidding me? At least Sabrina uses a Hyper Potion instead, and then I knock it out on the next turn. Next is Alakazam, and this is a place where Hypnosis can be useful. I think that just going for Body Slam right away, if I wasn't so heavily damaged, would have been the better choice. But in this case, since my Gengar is pretty bruised and she has good AI, I think that this is the only path to victory. With it put to sleep, I'm able to take it out over the next two turns with Body Slam, and earn myself the Marsh Badge. Finally, it's time to surf to Cinnabar Island. In Pokemon Mansion, I skip the optional vitamins, only picking up the Carbos on my way, and then I grab the two rare candies as well as the secret key, and dig out. Now, it's time for Blaine. 
So uh, let's like uh, let's put on some music that's just a little bit like happy or something. Definitely no gym leader music for this fight because Blaine in red and blue is quite possibly the worst gym leader in the entire game. No, like he is definitely the worst gym leader in the entire game. Like Giovanni gives him a run for his money, but it's not close. This guy is just terrible. Because he has good AI, his Growlithe is only going to spam agility against Gengar. Also, Blaine loves using super potions, which he does here. And then I knock the Growlithe out on the next turn. Ponyta's next. The only move it could hit me with would be Fire Spin, but like that's not going to do much because Gengar has awesome special. I take it out in a single critical hit, and then Rapidash is next. Okay, let's uh, let's watch this thing use uh, Fire Spin against me. And then, after the first hit, Blaine uses two Super Potions. Wonderful job. I knock the Rapidash out, and last is Arcanine. So, it could actually do a bit of damage because it has Fire Blast, uh, but instead it uses Ember. Wonderful job. Because of the amount of damage I'm dealing to it, it could use Fire Blast, but in this case it doesn't and I just take it out with my third Thunderbolt. So yeah, well done Blaine. So the Red Gengar is finishing this fight at 33 minutes and 52 seconds. This is an incredible time for this section of the game. So will Gengar and Pokemon Yellow be able to catch up? In this case, I actually do have to make the choice, do I go to Cinnabar Island or do I go to Sylph? In this case, I choose to go to Sylph next, just because there's some experience here, and Blaine in Pokemon Yellow is very challenging. He is not the pushover that we just witnessed in Pokemon Red. After collecting all the vitamins and defeating the Arbok trainer, Gengar is level 41. So is this going to be enough to defeat the rival here? Well, in Pokemon Yellow, I think that he's actually going to be easier for Gengar to defeat, and that's just because his Kadabra has not yet evolved into an Alakazam. However, he does start with Sand Slash, and this thing is going to become a problem later on when it gets Earthquake. But right now, its only move that can actually damage us is Poison Sting, and uh, it could be really annoying with Sand Attack. I'm just hoping that it doesn't use that. In this case, it uses Swift, that fails, and then I knock it out on the second turn. I use Thunderbolt against Cloyster, and it knocks it out in a single hit, and next is Magneton. I really wanted to avoid being paralyzed here, I'm forgetting that it doesn't have Thunder Wave, so I put it to sleep and then I knock it out over the next three turns with Psychic followed by two Thunderbolts. Next is Kadabra. Gengar outspeeds and knocks it out in one hit with Body Slam. Okay, so this is looking like a done deal. All that's left is Flareon. In this game, the Dark type doesn't exist, so Bite's a normal type move. That means the only things it can hit us with are Ember, Sand Attack, and Fire Spin, and I'm not very worried about those. I knock it out, and that's that. There's a little bit of extra experience for the Yellow Gengar here because I have to defeat Jesse and James, and after that I quickly sweep through Giovanni's team. I pick up Mimic next and then head to Sabrina's gym. Okay, let's take her on. She leads with Abra, and it's lucky I have Body Slam because I'm able to take it out in a single hit. That way I avoid its flash and I can move on to the Kadabra with my accuracy intact. I wasn't sure that Gengar was going to one-hit the Kadabra, but in this case I get a lucky critical hit and I knock it out in one turn. Okay, that's good. Next is Alakazam. Now I should mention here that this thing is 7 levels higher than it is in Pokemon Red, and it also has Psychic, which it doesn't have in Red version. But to balance that out, Sabrina also doesn't have good AI, so she's just going to use random moves. My second Body Slam paralyzes, but this doesn't prevent Alakazam from hitting a Psychic, which does absolutely massive damage to Gengar, taking it to 11 hit points. That wasn't a critical hit. Now because she's set up Reflect and Gengar has lower attack than it has special, I figured that using Thunderbolt now would be the best play. Unfortunately it doesn't knock the Alakazam out, and it gets another Psychic which knocks Gengar out. That is my first reset in Pokemon Yellow. Let's try this fight again. I knock the Abra out in a single hit, Kadabra's next, and this time it survives. But I'm lucky because Sabrina uses an X Defend, and this doesn't save it from my second Body Slam. Okay, it's time for Alakazam again. I go for Body Slam, it does less than half, but it does get Paralysis. Sabrina uses an X Defend, I go for Body Slam again, taking it down to one third, and then she uses Psy Wave. This doesn't do very much, I take Alakazam down to a sliver, and then it uses Recover. Ah, uh, that's really annoying. Maybe I'll get a critical hit. Well, I don't, but Alakazam's paralyzed, it can't move, and I knock it out as a result. So Gengar had a slightly bumpy Sabrina split in both games. I don't think it's truly inconsistent, but I do think it's a tiny bit random. So now I'm off to Cinnabar Island and Pokemon Mansion, where I once again skip the vitamins and head towards Blaine's gym. So I really need to talk about him in yellow because he is so much better. First of all, he has three team members, but they're all fully evolved, giving them significantly better stats. Also, they're much higher levels. Blaine's toughest Pokemon in red is level 48, but here his Arcanine is level 54. Additionally, they all have powerful fire moves, like Rapidash is the weakest with only fire spin, but I'm still worried. 
In this case, I'm using Psychic, even though it does less damage, just because it has a 33% chance to lower the opponent's special. If I do that, then I'll take less damage from his Fire-type moves. Unfortunately, Gengar hits itself twice in Confusion, and it's left with only 36 hit points when the Rapidash comes out. First turn against Rapidash, I hit myself, and then my Psychic hits, getting a critical hit, taking Rapidash down to orange health and lowering its special. Okay, that's nice. At least I'm not confused anymore. I knock it out, and Arcanine hits the field. So the only way I'm going to win now with my health this slow is if I can get a Hypnosis and knock the Arcanine out over several turns. Unfortunately, Hypnosis misses, and Arcanine sets up Reflect. I go for Hypnosis again, it misses, and Arcanine uses Fire Blast. So that's it. In the next fight, I decide that it makes more sense to use Hypnosis early on in the battle so that I can get through the Ninetales with full health. The Rapidash isn't much of a threat because despite being a rapid Pokemon, it is not faster than Gengar. Like Gengar has almost 160 speed, the Rapidash only has 118, like that thing's slow in comparison. I knock it out and move on to the Arcanine. I go for Psychic first turn, it lowers its special, and Blaine chooses Takedown. Ah, uh, good job. <laughs> He's like inspired by his former self in red version or something there. I get a critical hit next turn, and then I knock the Arcanine out for a clean sweep without taking any damage. Sweet. So uh, yeah, hard the first time, easy the second time. So after Sabrina and Blaine, the yellow Gengar has actually clawed back some time. It's now only 30 seconds behind the red Gengar. However, uh, if you don't know these games, something uh, very important is coming up next. For the red version Gengar, I have to face Giovanni. And uh, he is probably worse than Blaine, at least against Gengar. I just want you to look over at his team right now. Like, the Rhyhorn and the Rhydon have no moves that can hit Gengar. Fissure cannot actually hit the opponent if the opponent is faster. In this case, the Rhydon has 53 speed, so there's no way that move is hitting basically any opponent. Also, both of the Nidos can only hit Gengar with Poison Sting. Yep. So the only Pokemon that really has a chance to even do damage to me is the Dugtrio. I go for Psychic. It doesn't do quite enough. It takes Dugtrio down to red health, but that means it gets a dig off. Oh gosh, I really wish I had healed before this fight. Dugtrio comes up from underground, hits Dig, and knocks Gengar out. Ah, that's like the most frustrating reset. So the issue here is that I can't one-hit the Dugtrio with Psychic. The only way around this is going to be leveling up, and I haven't used any rare candies yet in Pokemon Red, so now is the time to use them. By the way, this is also why I do second playthroughs, because the timing of this was obviously the incorrect moment, like I should have just known to use the rare candies before this fight, I didn't know that, so my second playthrough I'll be able to correct this mistake. Because of how powerful Gengar is, I might as well just use all of my rare candies, and this pushes Gengar just over a damage rounding threshold so that it's sitting at level 53 before I attempt Giovanni again. I uh, still didn't heal going into this fight, but I really don't think I'm going to need it now. Psychic 1 hits Rhyhorn, Dugtrio's next, I use Psychic, and it's also a 1 hit. Yeah, so that's it! 1 hit the Nidoqueen, 1 hit the Nidoking, and uh, of course, 1 hit the Rhydon. Oh, no, it survives. It uses Fissure, but that's not going to do anything, so I just knock it out for free. So despite the one embarrassing reset, it was an easy battle, and Gengar is now off towards the League. As I fade between the Red Gengar and the Yellow Gengar, you can see that the Yellow Gengar is going into the Giovanni fight about 10 seconds before the Gengar in Red defeated him. Now, it might seem like the Yellow Gengar is gaining a lot of speed here, but that's not the case. Look at Giovanni's team. I actually get very lucky here because the Dugtrio just goes for Fissure and wastes its turn and I'm able to knock it out. It would have done so much damage with Dig or Earthquake. This Dugtrio is actually much higher level than the one in red. And then following that, while the Persian can't do anything to me other than lower my defense with Screech, the Nidoqueen, Nidoking, and Rhydon can all hit with super effective Earthquakes. And Giovanni has good AI, so he is always going to use these moves. What that means is I need one hits from here out. Because I'm level 46 and I'm not going to get the one hits, like I just know I'm not, I go for Hypnosis first turn against Nidoqueen, it misses, Giovanni strikes back with Earthquake, it does so much to Gengar, and that's a knockout. Okay, so taking a page out of my red version book, I think it's time to use some rare candies now. Problem is, I used rare candies earlier for Koga, so that means I have less available now, and I can only get over the damage rounding threshold at level 50, but not all the way up to level 53. So hopefully this will be enough. 
Unfortunately, it still means I can't one-hit the Doug Trio. Giovanni just uses a guard spec and gives me it anyways. Okay, time for the Persian. I'm gonna knock it out with Thunderbolt. It luckily fails two screeches before it goes down. That's really good because I want my defense for his following Pokemon. I go for Psychic now against the Nidoqueen, hoping for the one hit, and I get it because of a crit. All right, that was lucky. Nidoking's next. It has four more special than the Nidoqueen, so it's more likely to survive. And in this case, it does on red. It strikes back with Earthquake and knocks Gengar out with a critical hit. Uh, all right, this is not looking good. So I tried to beat Giovanni at the level that I arrived at, and I also tried using rare candies to get over a damage rounding threshold. However, there is another strategy, and that's to teach Mimic in the place of Body Slam, and then use it to mimic Persian's double team so that his following team members are less likely to hit Gengar. I have to get through the Doug Trio, of course, first. It just uses Fissure this time, and I knock it out. Okay, this is looking good. I mimic double team, and I set it up. By the way, this triggers the badge boost glitch, and I'll just quickly explain how that works. In Generation 1, whenever your Pokemon's stats are modified, its accuracy and evasion including, the game erroneously recalculates the badge boosts that each badge gives, and reapplies them to the stats. This compounds, so every time I use Double Team, you can see that my stats are going up. This is going to give Gengar better damage ranges against all of Giovanni's following Pokemon, so this has to be the strategy. Like, please, please, please. I knock the Nidoqueen out in one hit, the Nido King that follows is also a one hit, and then Gengar levels up to 51, which resets its badge boosts for the ride on. Okay, it just needs to not hit an earthquake. It misses, and I knock it out on the next turn. So that's it, Gengar in yellow has defeated Giovanni. As I head out to Route 21, the difference between the times has widened significantly now. The yellow Gengar is behind by a minute and 41 seconds. But I do think it has the potential to claw back some time here, because the rival on Route 22 doesn't have an Alakazam in this game. He leads with Sandslash and doesn't know a ground type move yet, so I don't have to worry about it. I knock it out with two turns of Psychic and then move on to the Execute. Now this thing knows Stun Spore, and also all of its moves are not very effective against Gengar, so it's just going to choose randomly, and I really don't want to get paralyzed for the rest of the fight. So I use Hypnosis, it misses, but my next one finally puts it to sleep. Okay, that's good. After that, I take it out over the next three turns with Thunderbolt. Cloyster goes down in a single hit, a critical hit at that, that was nice, and then Magneton comes out. Okay, I really don't want to get paralyzed here as well, but I don't want to risk it with Hypnosis. After all, Psychic is going to two hit. However, it uses Thunder Wave, paralyzing Gengar and cutting its speed, and then I can't move. So that's annoying. It gets a critical hit with Thundershock before I finally finish it with my own critical hit Psychic. Okay, so the whole reason I didn't want to get paralyzed there is because Kadabra is next, and now it's faster than Gengar. It sets up Reflect, and I go for Hypnosis because I know my consistency is cut due to paralysis. Also, I had to unlearn Body Slam earlier to get by Giovanni, and that has a consequence here because I can't do physical damage to this frail Pokemon. Luckily, Thunderbolt is doing half, so I'm able to take it out just as it wakes up. Flareon is next. It outspeeds, uses Flamethrower, taking Gengar to orange, and then I can't move. So, uh, not feeling good. Luckily, it misses Fire Spin, that move is so inaccurate, and then my Psychic hits, but it doesn't quite do half. At least it lowered Flareon's special. The rival's ace goes for Flamethrower again, taking Gengar to 36 hit points, and then my next Psychic hits, but it doesn't quite KO. Ugh, are you kidding me? Flareon strikes with Flamethrower one more time, Gengar survives on 15 hit points, Paralysis doesn't activate, and I take the victory. That was so close. Okay, so let's see how Gengar in Pokemon Red deals with the rival, especially his Alakazam. In my videos with Van Man where he erased the Nidorans, this was a huge time loss for Nidorans in Pokemon Red. Today, it might be the thing that balances the scales out between these two games. The rival's first Pokemon is Pidgeot, I use Thunderbolt, and it takes it out in a single hit. That's good. Rhyhorn's next, it can't hit me, and I take it out in a single Psychic, leading to his Execute. Now, I got a little bit risky here, and I used Body Slam, which gets a critical hit. Execute just goes for Solar Beam, and I knock it out. Next is Gyarados, Thunderbolt is obviously a one hit, and Alakazam is next. Okay, so instead of rolling for Hypnosis, I'm just going to attack this thing right away, and hope that I can tank at least one Psychic. In this case, I paralyze Alakazam, but it still moves, uses Psychic, and it does about half to Gengar. All right, that's not that bad. I knock it out, and Charizard is next. Now, my special was lowered, so I'm not sure if Thunderbolt's gonna get the KO, but in this case, I get a critical hit, and Charizard goes down anyways. All right, so the rival that I thought was gonna slow down Gengar in red actually turned out to be very easy. I was able to tank the Psychic and still win despite having my special lowered. 
I can't really think of a more dominant performance for Gengar. It's off to the league at a time of 36 minutes and 30 seconds. That is incredible. So let's recap how these runs have stacked up so far. From Brock through Misty, the Gengar in Pokemon Red had an advantage. And then at Lieutenant Surge, Pokemon Yellow clawed back the advantage, probably because of my mistake on Misty. After that, the Gengar in Red has been ahead the entire time, and his lead has only been widening. Now after defeating the rival on Route 22, it's 2 minutes and 2 seconds ahead. But I still have to defeat the league, so let's get into that. Now the yellow Gengar has a distinct disadvantage against Lorelei, and that's the fact that her Slowbro knows Psychic in this game, which is super effective against Gengar. I knock out the Dugong and the Cloyster with Thunderbolt, and proceed to the Pokemon I'm most worried about with full health. However, I have a strategy here and it's my standard strategy, I'll mimic Amnesia and then set it up. Luckily, Slowbro goes for its own Amnesias, and so I get mine set up before it finally hits me with Psychic. However, it follows up with another Psychic, and takes Gengar to Orange. Ugh, this is not good. I don't think I'm going to be able to knock it out fast enough with Thunderbolt since it's set up itself, so I put it to sleep with Hypnosis, and then I use Thunderbolt, which by the way does way more than I was expecting. Like, what? Still, the Slowbro survives, and I knock it out on the next turn despite Lorelei's attempt to save it with the Super Potion. Next is Jinx. Because it's the Psychic type, Thunderbolt makes the most sense here. I've set up with Amnesia after all. However, I get a critical hit, which in Generation 1 means my positive stat changes are not applied, and Jinx survives, allowing it to get an Ice Punch in. Luckily, it doesn't freeze me, and I take it out. Last is Lapras. I go for Thunderbolt, and of course, it's a one-hit. So Gengar in yellow has got by Lorelei with ease. And then in the next room, there's this guy. Yeah, um, I don't really know what to say in this fight. Like, I have Psychic. He has rock Pokemon, which have terrible special. And he also has fighting Pokemon, which, uh, yeah, don't survive my psychic. <laughs> so the hiker's defeated, and now I'm moving on to Agatha. Now my regular strategy here is to mimic Substitute. I do this so I can set up my own moves, like Hypnosis if I want to, or stat boosting moves, and then I can strike back without being annoyed by things like Confuse Ray. But in this case with Gengar, its special is so good, and it has Psychic, I think I can just sweep her entire team. I knock the first Gengar out in one hit, that's nice, then she sends in Golbat, and it survives. It tries Supersonic, misses, and then I knock it out the next turn. Okay, that's fine. Next is Haunter, of course, Psychic, oh, it doesn't one hit, are you kidding me? At least Agatha just uses a Super Potion, and then I knock it out. Arbok's next, Psychic finally one hits here, uh, it's a critical hit, it's just like, oh my gosh, this fight's weird, but I've made it to her final Gengar. The thing that I'm really concerned about here is it using Hypnosis, so I use my own Hypnosis to put it to sleep. Because of that, I'm able to use Psychic twice, and knock it out. So Gengar is getting through these fights in the fastest possible way. Next is Lance, and Gyarados is first, I can obviously knock it out in a single hit with Thunderbolt, and then he sends in his first Dragonair. Okay, so I tried Psychic here, hoping that it would one hit, but the Dragonair survives and uses Thunder Wave, paralyzing Gengar. That's really not good. I knock it out on the next turn with a follow-up Psychic, and then his second Dragonair comes out. Here, I can't get frozen by Ice Beam since I'm paralyzed, but that also means I can't Mimic, and then when I finally do Mimic, I accidentally go too fast and Mimic Bubble Beam. Uh, this is very frustrating. By the way, if you want to see my live reactions to this playthrough, you can watch my Gengar stream, which I did live. That's this yellow playthrough that I'm narrating right now. I still managed to knock the Dragonair out and move on to the Aerodactyl. It hits a massive fly, taking Gengar down to 22 hit points, and then I hit with Thunderbolt and knock it out. But the problem is, Lance has a Dragonite, it moves first, hits Blizzard, and Gengar goes down. So that's a pretty frustrating reset. I think the solution here is fairly obvious. I need to put his first Dragonair to sleep and avoid paralysis. But in this case, Hypnosis of course misses and Gengar gets paralyzed anyways. Ah, so frustrating. This time, I successfully mimic the correct move. And then I use it to take out the Dragonair, the Aerodactyl. And in this case, I actually survive the Dragonite's attack. However, I'm paralyzed so I can't move and then Dragonite finishes Gengar again. Okay, please Hypnosis, work on the Dragonair. Again it misses, and then I get paralyzed as a result. Uh, so I'm not resetting right away because there is a chance that I could win, like the Dragonite could miss or something like that. In this case, I don't even get to the Dragonite though because Aerodactyl finishes me off with Wing Attack. Okay, come on, this has to be the time that I put the Dragonair to sleep. I do get it, and I knock it out for free. That's good. I managed to mimic Ice Beam, the Dragonair uses Bubble Beam so it didn't even have a chance to freeze me, and I knock it out with my own Ice Beam. 
because Aerodactyl has 170 speed, I'm guaranteed the KO with Ice Beam, and following that, I KO the Dragonite with four times effective ice damage. So that's that. Gengar has beat Lance in Pokemon Yellow. It clocks in with a time of 45 minutes and 13 seconds. So how will Gengar in Red version do during the league? Well here it potentially has a big advantage over Yellow version, because it can mimic Amnesia from Slowbro for free. Look at its moves, it doesn't have any other psychic moves, and because of good AI, that means Lorelei is just going to spam Amnesia over and over and over again with Slowbro. However, I actually think that Gengar might just be able to win this fight with Thunderbolt alone and keep Body Slam on its moveset. I take the Slowbro out over two turns and move on to the Jinx, I go for Thunderbolt here, it does half, and then I knock it out on the next turn with Body Slam. Okay, it's time for Lapras. Thunderbolt does more than half, and here's the thing about Lapras, it uses Confuse Ray, because Lorelei has good AI, so she's only ever going to use this Ghost type move against my Gengar. So really, by just sweeping with Thunderbolt, the only place I could have lost was if Jinx froze me with Ice Punch, or if Gengar gets incredibly unlucky and KOs itself with self-inflicted confusion damage. That doesn't happen, and I take a quick win. Next is this guy. His movesets are even worse in red, like I cannot believe how much worse he is in red. Yeah, Gengar takes an easy victory, so yeah, that's it, I'm moving on to Agatha. Now, J. Rose calls this the Agatha Lottery, and I think that that's a very fitting name for it in Pokemon Red. After all, these Pokemon are incredibly annoying. The first Gengar in yellow does not have Hypnosis, and in this game, it does. So I'm a bit worried about that. However, it just confuses my Gengar and then I knock it out. I hit myself once in confusion against Golbat, but then Psychic connects and knocks it out on the next turn. Now it's time for Haunter, and while I sweep it and the following Arbok, you'll notice that my Gengar is a higher level in red, and that's because I waited longer to use my rare candies. After all, I didn't have a difficult opponent like Koga to overcome. So that's really an advantage here. I'm doing a little bit more damage to her Gengar, in this case it just uses Nightshade against me, and then I knock it out. So Gengar has made it to Lance in red version, and here we really have to look at the movesets, because Lance is terrible in red version when you're a poison type. His first Dragonair, which caused so many problems for my yellow Gengar, is not going to cause any problems at all because it has agility. This is a psychic type move, and because Lance has good AI, it's just going to spam it over and over again. Well, it would if my Psychic didn't get a critical hit and knock it out. However, the second Dragonair is no different, meaning I also get a crit on it and knock it out in a single hit, so that's nice. There is one disadvantage here, which is that I can't mimic Ice Beam from any of his Pokemon. However, Thunderbolt's enough to one-hit the Aerodactyl. Oh, with another crit? Like, am I just going to crit his entire team? However, let's talk about Ice Beam again, because I don't really need it for the Dragonite, because it knows Agility and Barrier, two Psychic moves, and it's just going to spam these over and over again, while I knock it out with Thunderbolt. So that's that. Gengar in Pokemon Red has clocked in after Lance with an incredibly fast time. 40 minutes and 56 seconds. This is one of the fastest times that I have ever been at this point of the game in. However, my time spent playing Yellow has taught me that the champion is the hardest trainer of them all. But is that the case in Pokemon Red? Well, in red version, he leads with Pidgeot, and this thing has a terrible moveset. I go for Thunderbolt, and I get the one hit anyways. So yeah, so far, so good. Next is Alakazam, and this thing could be scary. Luckily, I move first, hit with Body Slam, because I have been able to retain this move to this point, and it does more than half. Alakazam strikes back with Psybeam, and it does almost half to Gengar, and then I finish it on the next turn. Alright, I think I'm by my biggest threat now. Because the Rhydon has no way to hit me, I'm able to knock it out over two turns with Psychic, and move on to the following Executor. So, uh, are you ready for the pain? I try Body Slam, it does very little. And then I try Thunderbolt, which does even less, obviously, because it's resisted. And then Executor puts me to sleep with Hypnosis. Now watch Gengar snooze. <laughs> like, the Executor cannot actually damage me but uh, it's wasting my time very effectively. Once I wake up, I accidentally use a body slam and then I immediately switch into hypnosis because I'm like, I gotta put this thing to sleep so it doesn't stall me out with sleep. However, I miss and then it hits a hypnosis and puts Gengar back to sleep. Ah, oh, so this thing is extremely frustrating. Finally, this time when I wake up, I put it to sleep and then I'm able to knock it out. Although that did waste quite a bit of time. Next is Gyarados and I use Thunderbolt, taking it out in a single hit. So apparently this thing didn't actually make his team stronger the Executor was the thing that made his team stronger. Last is Charizard, and of course Thunderbolt is super effective. I use it, it takes the Fire type to red health, and then it strikes back with Fire Blast, which does a lot, but Gengar survives and knocks it out the next turn. 
It clocks in with a time of 42 minutes and 7 seconds, with 4 resets at level 61. And all of this took 2 hours and 41 minutes of game time. I also want to note here the Halloween themed money that we have. Very fitting, I did not plan that. It would be cool if I did. Now we have to complete these runs, so let's switch over and see how the Yellow Gengar does against the champion. In this case, his first Pokemon is Sandslash, and I cannot tell you how much I hate this thing. It now has Earthquake, and it's also incredibly tanky. There is no way that I'm going to one-shot it with Psychic, so I have to use Hypnosis first. Unfortunately, I miss, and Sandslash hits with Earthquake. It does so much, taking Gengar down to 7 hit points in a single turn. I try for Hypnosis again, because after all, this is the only way I can get through the fight now. It misses, and Sandslash finishes me off. Okay, let's try that again. On the next fight, Hypnosis misses again, Earthquake hits, and this time it one hits Gengar. So it looks like it has a roll against me. I've used all my rare candies to get Gengar to level 58 at this point, so I can't even level up more for this fight without blacking out and starting again from the beginning of the league, which would just obviously give Gengar a time that wouldn't be competitive with Red. In the next fight, I miss Hypnosis again, and surprisingly, I survive its Earthquake with one hit point, but that's probably not going to be enough. After all, I don't have any recovery moves. Still, I could get very lucky, so I mimic Earthquake, and then I move on to the Alakazam. Let's see if this physical move is going to one-shot it. And the answer is yes, when it gets a critical hit. Next is Executor, and uh, yeah, I've learned my lesson. I need to put this thing to sleep, or it'll put me to sleep. Unfortunately, I miss, and it hits with Hypnosis, and uh, yeah, now it's going to waste my time again. In this case, the good AI affects this Executor in a really weird way. You think that it could use Leech Life to deal damage to Gengar, but it thinks that Leech Life is not very effective, and it thinks that Hypnosis is super effective, so it's trying to use Hypnosis all the time, but his second AI modification says that when I'm asleep, it should use moves other than Hypnosis. So basically, it never uses Leech Seed, tries to use Hypnosis all the time, and then it'll use Barrage and Stomp if I have a status condition. Because of that, I'm able to knock it out and move on to the following Magneton. Okay, Earthquake, please come through for me here. I do not need a repeat of my Gyarados playthrough. But unfortunately, because Gengar has lower attack, it doesn't get the one hit, and Magneton finishes me off with Thunderbolt. Alright, so this is uh, starting to get frustrating. Gengar loses the next fight because of Earthquake getting a critical hit. Alright, I'm getting so fed up trying to use Hypnosis here. What happens if I just try Psychic? And uh, yeah, it one hits the Sand Slash, but because it got a critical hit. I'm sure that if I rolled regular damage, I would not have knocked it out. However, now I'm in a weird position because I don't have a physical move for the Alakazam, so I'm going to need Hypnosis here anyways. I luckily put it to sleep, and then I'm able to knock it out with three uses of Thunderbolt. Okay, Executor time. In this case, I didn't prioritize Hypnosis. I was thinking, what if I crit, or like, what if I just like slowly knock it out? But yeah, it doesn't work, I get put to sleep, it's really annoying, and then I'm like, yeah, I should use Hypnosis. So I put it to sleep, and after that, I knock it out. Good. Next is Magneton, and here I want to illustrate the problem of not using Hypnosis against the first Sand Slash. Now I don't have Earthquake, so now I have to use Hypnosis here if I want any chance of getting past this thing without being paralyzed. I miss first turn, take a lot of damage from Thunderbolt, and then I put it to sleep. Okay, that's good. I start using Psychic, it lowers its special, and then I knock it out on the next turn. Okay, good. Now it's time for the Cloister, I one hit with Thunderbolt, and that means I've done it. The final Flareon knows Reflect, which is a Psychic type move, and so it's going to spam it against Gengar. I finish it off, albeit taking some time because he used a full restore, and Gengar clocks in in Pokemon Yellow, with a time of 48 minutes and 40 seconds, with 11 resets at level 59. And this took 2 hours and 50 minutes of game time. So Gengar beat Pokemon Red 6 minutes and 33 seconds faster when playing on 4 times game speed. It also had 7 less resets, and it was able to squeeze out 2 more levels, finishing the game at level 61 instead of level 59. Finally, its game time was also 9 minutes lower. And I would say that this difference here is mostly because of small differences between the game, like extra dialogue in certain locations, and having to like walk more places, like, for instance, from the Pokey Fan Club to Diglett's Cave in Pokemon Yellow. Of course, this isn't a good enough result, it isn't nearly as scientific as I would like it to be, so let's jump into additional playthroughs with Gengar in both games, and see how much time I can shave off these results. How close can I get it between these games, and is it possible to get Gengar under 40 minutes? Let's see. 
So the first thing I change in this playthrough is I give my Gengar a single character nickname. If you've been watching closely with all my second playthroughs, I always do this, and this is because it takes frames to render characters on the screen. As a result, shorter names and shorter nicknames render faster and give me a small time advantage. I will admit this is probably only going to save about like 5 to 10 seconds in the total run, because on 4 times speed this matters much less than it does when you're playing at regular game speed. After all, me just bumping into walls and stuff like that trying to get through doors is going to waste much more time than this will save. From here, the early game is mostly unchanged. I defeat Brock, I defeat the rival on Nugget Bridge, I defeat Misty, and then I head to the SSN. And here, I make my first major change with Gengar, because for yellow version, I am going to pick up Rest. I think that this move is going to give Gengar so much more consistency in the champion fight, because if it just squeezes through Sandslash and Alakazam, it can then heal on the Executor. Things do get a little bit annoying at the wrapping last because her Oddish does paralyze Gengar. That means that Bellsprout could use Wrap and just waste my time. However, in this case, the second Bellsprout just goes for Growth, which triggers the glitch, cutting Gengar's speed to 1, and then my Body Slam knocks it out in one turn. So, not very much time wasted there. Things also get very close against the Pokemaniac's Q-Bone. Like, it takes me to red health. It's so good that I have Thunderbolt to one-shot the Slowpoke. After that, I make it out of Rock Tunnel and arrive in Celadon with a time of 18 minutes and 8 seconds. By the way, in my previous playthrough, I was here at 19 minutes and 16 seconds. So I've actually been able to improve my time by 1 minute and 8 seconds, while also getting rest. This is looking very good. In the department store, I still buy 3 calcium, and then I teach Gengar Psychic and stomp my way through Pokemon Tower. After that, in Erika's gym, I make a small change. Previously, I fought the mandatory trainer with only one execute, but in Pokemon Yellow, I can go to the right side of Erika and face two trainers before her. My intention was when I rooted this that this would give me enough experience to level up to level 35 after I defeated her, but when I knock out her gloom, Gengar has just a tiny sliver of experience left before it gets level 35. So just before I head to Koga's gym, I run over to the grass and knock out one wild Pokemon to get level 35. This way I can use all five rare candies I've collected to this point to give Gengar level 40 before it starts fighting the trainers in Koga's gym. I still save in front of these jugglers because I want to be really safe, but they're much easier at a higher level. At level 41 against Koga, Gengar gets guaranteed 1 hits on all 3 of his Venonats. The Venomoth is going to be a guaranteed 2 hit, but I do have a 20% chance to 1 hit it. I wanted this damage to be high not because of Gengar's damage output, but so that it could survive Venomoth's hits. After all, even at level 41, the Venomoth still has more than a 1% chance to 1 hit Gengar, and it has a 58% chance to 2 hit. So the last thing I want is like its first Psychic getting a special drop and then it knocking me out on the next turn. And today, the Venomoth gets a critical hit with Psychic, and look how much it does to Gengar! Gengar survives with 1 hit point and knocks the Venomoth out. I am really glad I routed the playthrough in this way. Next, I go to Sylph. And while I do go to the 10th floor to pick up the Carbos and Rare Candy, I have eliminated some useless items here, specifically the Calcium and the Protein. Next, it's time to face the Rival, so let's examine the damage ranges against him. Psychic is a guaranteed 2 hit on the Sand Slash. I considered using Hypnosis against it to try and avoid Sand Attack, however in this case, I think it actually makes it more likely that you get hit by a Sand Attack if you use Hypnosis here. The reason is that it doesn't know what move to use, so it's just randomizing between all the moves it knows. In this case you can see that because it uses Swift, which obviously does nothing to Gengar. So in this case, it only has a 25% chance to use Sand Attack, but Hypnosis has a 40% chance to miss. So just spamming Psychic twice quickly knocks the Sand Slush out. Also, I should note, if you get Sand Attack on the very first turn, you can reset right away and not spend very much time through the reset to get a more favorable outcome in the next fight. Obviously, the following Cloister goes down to a single hit from Thunderbolt, and then Magneton comes out. Now this seems a little bit unfortunate because Gengar doesn't always get the 2 hit. It has a 51% chance to get the 2 hit and it's guaranteed to get the 3 hit. However, this Magneton doesn't know Thunder Wave, so it's way less likely to paralyze Gengar. However, of course, in this fight it gets paralysis first turn. I am lucky enough to get the 2 hit and move on to the Kadabra though. However, in this case the paralysis is too much and Gengar goes down. So that's my first reset in my second playthrough. In the next fight, I get a critical hit against Magneton and that speeds up my process against it, and then I move on to the Kadabra. Here I use Body Slam, it takes it out in a single hit, by the way that's guaranteed, and now it's time for Flareon. By the way, against the Flareon, both Thunderbolt and Body Slam are doing basically the same damage, so it doesn't really matter which one you use. I think I should be using Body Slam first turn just for the 30% chance to paralyze, but in this case I use Thunderbolt and knock it out anyways. 
With Sylph out of the way, I head over to Sabrina's gym to fight her. Now this one is a little bit risky. While Gengar does outspeed all of her Pokemon, its physical damage isn't doing enough to one-hit the Kadabra, and that allows it to get a huge Psychic in, taking me down to 24 health. So here's the thing I've been trying to optimize out of my playthrough this time. Uses of Hypnosis. As you can see in the Rival in Sylph, I didn't actually use Hypnosis once. I haven't actually used it once in this entire playthrough. But here, when I'm sitting on red health going into her Alakazam, I think Hypnosis makes the most sense. If I get it, I can still win, but if I don't, it's most likely that the Alakazam is just going to KO me right away. In this case, I successfully put the Alakazam to sleep, and because of that, I get three Body Slimes in a row knocking it out. So, that's great, no resets on Sabrina. At this point, I already have enough speed to outspeed every Pokemon on Giovanni's team. As a result, I'm skipping items like the Carbos in Pokemon Mansion, and I head straight to Blaine. Before I fight him, I want to go over the next damage rounding threshold, so I feed Gengar three rare candies, taking it to level 48. This actually gives my damage ranges some big boosts. Ninetales is largely the same, I have a 38% chance to two hit it. In this case, I need three hits and then it goes down. Next is Rapidash, and feeding the rare candies boosted this percent from a 38% chance to two hit to a 50% chance to two hit. In this case, I do get unlucky, I don't get the two hit, but I take it out in three hits. After all, the Flaming Horse can't really do anything to Gengar. Last is Arcanine, and if I started the fight at level 45, I would have leveled up to 46 by the time it came out. However, I would only have a 6% chance to two hit it. But in this case, with three rare candies, I now have a 30% chance to two hit it, and in this case, I get it. So that's it, Blaine's out of the way. However, the toughest gym leader is next, because now Gengar has to contend with Giovanni and his ground types. Before I do that, I have some fancy footwork with a rare candy. After I defeat the first trainer in Giovanni's gym, I use one rare candy because Gengar has just leveled up, and this pushes it over the next damage rounding threshold to level 50. I finish off the following black belt, and then I head to Giovanni himself. For this battle, I wish I had a better solution. Unfortunately, I have to two hit the Dugtrio. At least it can't hit me with Fissure. And after that, I set up double team on the Persian. I can't afford to be hit by an earthquake later on. After doing that, I'm able to successfully sweep his team and move on to the league. For the final rival, I mimic Slash from Sandslash, and then I use it on Execute. Unfortunately, it's only doing half, and I get paralyzed in the process, which is really bad. I do manage to take the Cloister out, but Magneton does some damage, because it's a 3 hit. Sometimes, I have a 93% chance to 2 hit this thing. And then the following Kadabra just uses Psychic and knocks Gengar out. So, that's my second reset. However, the Execute's not always going to use Stun Spore. I should probably just reset if it uses Stun Spore right away. In this case, it doesn't, and I knock it out. Then, to be safe against the Magneton, I decide to use Hypnosis. I need to get to the Kadabra without Paralysis. As a result, I'm able to move first and take it out with Slash in one hit, and then I can two-hit the Flareon with Slash, tanking a critical hit from Flamethrower in the process. This still was close. So it's time for Lorelite. Previously in this fight, I mimicked Amnesia and set up so that I could sweep her remaining Pokemon. However, I actually think this wastes time for Gengar and makes the fight more unpredictable. Because in this case, the Slowbro knows Psychic. However, if I just spam Thunderbolt, I defeat all of her Pokemon quite quickly, and there isn't really any risk because the final Lapras has Confuse Ray. I guess the main risk that I'm trying to avoid here would be like a critical hit Psychic from the Slowbro, which is extremely unlikely, or a Freeze from the Jinx. Neither happened in this playthrough, and I defeat her on my first attempt. So now it's time for Agatha. I get lucky with a critical hit against her first Gengar and knock it out in a single hit. Nice. After that, I think it's best to just spam Psychic and knock all of her Pokemon out as fast as possible. Gengar is kind of weak here because they have Psychic type moves, but also it can get through the fight really quickly by just attacking. I do end up getting confused by the final Gengar, but this doesn't matter because I only hit myself once and then my second Psychic knocks it out. Okay, it's time for Lance, and I have to say, the solution here is very unsatisfying. While I can one-hit the Gyarados, the first Dragonair knows Thunder Wave, and I have to put it to sleep to avoid paralysis. In this case, it wakes up right away, my next Hypnosis misses, and then it gets Thunder Wave off, so... Ah, this is really frustrating. With my speed cut, I actually decide to reset right away because it's not worth playing out the rest of the fight and losing after spending a significant amount of time trying to win. Instead, I just sweep through the Gyarados quickly again, put the Dragonair to sleep, and knock it out with two Psychics. Then, on the second Dragonair, I can mimic Ice Beam successfully, and sweep through Lance's remaining three Pokémon. So, while Gengar is just under 39 minutes going into the Champion fight, it isn't going to clock in under 40 minutes today. So my moveset for this fight is Thunderbolt, Rest, Hypnosis, and Psychic. I need Hypnosis against the first Sandslash because I have to put it to sleep. 
In this case, I miss, it hits Earthquake, and knocks me out. So that's a quick first reset. In the next battle, I successfully put it to sleep, and I can knock it out with two turns of Psychic, taking no damage before the Alakazam. Here, once again, I need Hypnosis. It puts the Psychic type to sleep, and then I can knock it out with three uses of Thunderbolt. Okay, I also need Hypnosis for the Executor, just so it doesn't put me to sleep and waste my time. Ah, uh, there's a little bit of a back and forth here. It does put me to sleep once, and then I eventually knock it out. Okay, Magneton. I once again need to put this thing to sleep so that I don't get paralyzed for the remainder of the fight. After all, paralysis and then getting hit by clamp over and over and a critical hit from flamethrower is just not acceptable. Especially when the Magneton is a 3 hit with Psychic. After I take it out though, this fight's over. I one shot the Cloister with Thunderbolt, and then the Flareon's only going to use Reflect. So today, Gengar clocks in with a time of 41 minutes and 22 seconds with 4 resets at level 59. This took 2 hours and 37 minutes of game time. So this is an improvement of 7 minutes and 18 seconds over Gengar's previous time. And it also has 7 less resets while finishing at the exact same level. I guess this is what happens when I get a bit more lucky against the champion and cut down on my use of hypnosis. I think it's also key to mention at this point that this is the fastest time I've ever got in Pokemon Yellow. So Gengar is going at the top of the tier list. We can just put him here now. I think this has been a long time coming, especially after my Alakazam vs Gengar video. So uh, Gengar fans rejoice, this thing is an absolute beast. And now we need to see what it can do to Pokemon Red, because believe me, this is going to be absolutely wild. So here's the thing about Pokemon Red. These games are significantly easier for two reasons. One, all of the major battles in the mid game are much easier for a Pokemon like Gengar, after all, Blaine is incompetent, Sabrina has lower levels, and Giovanni is like a joke, basically. So yeah, Gengar doesn't have to worry about getting levels for the tricky fights like it did in Yellow version. Additionally, the late game with trainers like Lance is essentially free because they just spam useless psychic stat boosting moves. As a result, in Red version, when I get to the SSN, I actually end up skipping the Gentleman Candy and Rest. So in that case, that's two optional trainers that I've completely cut out of the playthrough. I do still pick up Body Slam because I think that that move is just so useful for this playthrough. I crush my way through Surge, and then I make it to Celadon City at 17 minutes and 18 seconds. So this is roughly 50 seconds ahead of Yellow already in the early game. And from here, as we saw before, the lead is only going to widen. I pick up Psychic, crush the Wyvern up Pokemon Tower, and then I make my way all the way back to Erica's Gym. Here, in red version, I don't think that I need to do the optional trainers on the right-hand side, so I just fight the one mandatory trainer with Execute instead. After that, I crush Erica, and then I head directly to Koga's gym. Now here's the thing for Gengar, I don't need to use my rare candies here, because Koga's an absolute joke. Like, I went into this fight without healing, and even in like the worst case scenario where I got hit by some sludges and taken to red health, I still wasn't scared, and I managed to defeat Koga on my first attempt. After that, I head to Sylph, and here I do go to the 10th floor and pick up the rare candy. After all, it's really fast to defeat the guy with the Machoke, but you'll also notice that I just skipped the Carbos entirely. I don't want to waste the like 2 seconds that it takes to like pick that item up. It also takes like 2 or 3 more seconds to open your inventory and actually feed it to Gengar, so that's like maybe 5 seconds that I'm saving there. By the way, Gengar is just so fast I don't need any speed, especially because the levels are lower in the mid game. So yeah, I'm less worried about speed. Believe me, speed is so important in yellow, like it seems like I'm hyper fixated on it all the time, but it really is impactful in those games. In this game, much less so. Now by this point in yellow, I would have fed Gengar a lot of rare candies already. But here for the rival in Sylph, I don't need them. I just save and go into the battle, knock the Pidgeot out, level up, going over a damage rounding threshold, one shot the Gyarados, uh, Growlithe is next, this thing is absolutely terrible. And then for Alakazam, I don't even need Hypnosis, I'm just gonna two shot it with Body Slam. After that, you'll notice that I'm fighting the Venusaur team this time, and that's specifically so the rival doesn't have Executor in the final fight. I do not want it wasting my time with Hypnosis. I defeat Giovanni and Sylph, and this takes Gengar to level 41 exactly. And that's perfect because then I can feed Gengar 5 rare candies, taking it all the way to level 46. Now you might wonder why I don't use all 6 rare candies going to level 47, or instead just stay at level 45, which is just over the next damage rounding threshold. Well basically, going to level 46 makes experience much better throughout the late game, and going to level 47 actually prevents a couple level ups later on, which I don't want to have happen. 
With Gengar's current damage ranges, Body Slam is guaranteed one hit on the Kadabra. Unfortunately though, Mr. Mime is going to take two hits, and Body Slam and Thunderbolt are both dealing about the same damage, so because this thing knows Barrier, I'm going to choose to use Thunderbolt instead. And because of that, I knock it out in two turns. Next is Venomoth, and Psychic gets the guaranteed one hit here, and that leads to her Alakazam. While I do have about a 10% chance to one hit this thing with Body Slam, today I don't get it because I get a bad roll on my critical hit. Sabrina uses a Hyper Potion, healing Alakazam to full, and then my next Body Slam takes it to half. Unfortunately then, Alakazam sets up Reflect, delaying the battle one more turn. It gets a side wave in, and then I knock it out. So, still no losses for Gengar in Pokemon Red. In Pokemon Mansion, once again, I just leave the Carbos behind. I really don't need it. And then I head to face Blaine. Now because this fight's absolutely easy, I'll explain why I didn't fight Blaine before Sabrina. The reason is that in red version to save time, the fastest surfing Pokemon you can obtain is Lapras. So I had to defeat Sylph after defeating Koga. Then because I'm already in Saffron City, it makes sense to take care of Sabrina before surfing south to Cinnabar Island. After all, I save time if I prevent myself from backtracking to a location later on in the playthrough. And now, here is the most important thing in this entire playthrough. I used 3 Roar Candies before Giovanni, taking Gengar to level 51. And this is important because these 3 Roar Candies give Gengar the guaranteed 1 hit on Dugtrio. This way this entire fight is completely consistent, no chance that I'm going to get hit by a dig this time. I knock the Rhydon out with 2 hits, and that's that. So it's time to face the final rival. Thunderbolt 1 hits the Pidgeot, Psychic 1 hits the Rhyhorn, Thunderbolt 1 hits the Gyarados, Thunderbolt also 1 hits the Growlithe, and then against Alakazam, why would I use Hypnosis? Because Body Slam has a 30% chance to paralyze, it does in this case, and then I knock it out over the next two turns because he used Reflect. Next is Venusaur, and Psychic doesn't actually get a guaranteed 1 hit against this thing, so I use Body Slam first turn just in case it paralyzes. After that, I switch to Psychic and knock it out on the next turn. Against Lorelei, I sweep with Thunderbolt, and then against Agatha, I sweep with Psychic. At Lance, I don't need to worry about his team because all of his dragons have agility, so yep, free win here as well. And with that, Gengar has made it to the champion, with a time under 38 minutes. By the way, before this battle, I fed Gengar a rare candy. That pushes it just over the damage rounding threshold from 57 up to 58. I have an 82% chance to one-shot the Pidgeot. I do in this case, that's nice. Alakazam's next, and I have a 93% chance to two-hit it with Body Slam. In this case, it uses Reflect, so this one's a three-hit. However, in this case, Alakazam is less risky to face than in Yellow version, because it knows Reflect instead of Kinesis. Obviously, Kinesis is much worse. Rhydon's next, and uh, this thing is just awful. Doesn't even matter that it takes two hits with Psychic. Next is Gyarados, I one-hit it with Thunderbolt, and then Arcanine comes out. Here's the thing, I'd much rather fight this than the Executor. Even though it burns me, that doesn't matter because all that's left is Venusaur, and I can two-shot it with Psychic taking minimal damage from Mega Drain in the process. So that's it. Gengar clocks in with a time of 38 minutes and 27 seconds. Zero resets at level 59. This took 2 hours and 32 minutes of game time. Okay, so this is my fastest time that I've ever got in a Generation 1 game. Obviously, this is a completely dominant performance, so now it's time to rank Gengar in my Pokemon Red tier list. Right now, it's pretty lonely because there's only Gyarados, so let's give him some company because Gengar is an absolute beast. Both of these two have exceptional performances in this game, and I think they're both deserving of S tier finishes right now. I guess I'm going to have to play some Pokemon that are bad in Pokemon Red very soon. Now I reflected on these results for a long time because I was not very happy with my performance in Pokemon Yellow. After all, Gengar had 4 resets and it really feels like it should have less. Also, I just wasn't satisfied with the fact that my time was over 40 minutes. I really want to get a sub 40 time. So in my talks with Speedrunner, he mentioned something to me which I think is extremely interesting and I'm going to try in this playthrough. So just after Nugget Bridge, I can fight this optional hiker who has 4 Pokemon on his team. Now originally I thought this would be more of a time waste than a time save, because the whole goal of doing this fight is so that I can fight the junior trainer, move him out of the way, and pick up the TM for Seismic Toss. But why is Seismic Toss useful when Gengar has a move like Nightshade, which already does fixed damage based on the user's level? Well, remember the champion's executor? I had to knock it out with either Thunderbolt or Psychic, two moves that it resists, and while I did that, I had to spam Hypnosis to ensure that it didn't put me to sleep and waste time. This led to a lot of back and forth where I wasted time because I got put to sleep and then I had to put it to sleep and then I missed with Hypnosis, like, uh, awful, right? Okay, 
So I don't want to take Nightshade through the entire game on my moveset, because that really constricts Gengar's possibilities in the mid game. However, if I pick up Seismic Toss, then when I reach the champion, I can teach this move to Gengar. However, before I get there, I should mention that the pre-league rival, he actually did cause me to have one reset because of paralysis. Again, these Pokemon that paralyze you are just so annoying. Like, yes, the rival only has a Kadabra in this game, and he has an Alakazam in Pokemon Red and Blue, but for the Alakazam, you're not going into that fight paralyzed. In this case, going into the fight against Kadabra paralyzed is so awful, because it's always going to move first against you. Still, I managed to defeat him on my second attempt and make it to the league. Here, unfortunately, I have to confront Lance again, and I need to use Hypnosis on his first Dragonair to avoid Thunder Wave. The only way I could get through this without Paralysis would be if Psychic got a critical hit, and that is less likely than Hypnosis hitting. Unfortunately, in this case, it gets a Thunder Wave, so I reset right away, and I try the fight again. So, two resets. Okay, I'm. this is starting to get a bit sketchy and a bit close to my previous result. I'm not feeling great. However, Gengar does defeat Lance, at just over 38 minutes, so it's possible to get a sub-40 finish still. Please, I just need Hypnosis to work against the Sand Slash and the Alakazam. Okay, it works against the Sand Slash, and I knock it out with two uses of Psychic. Next is Alakazam. I put it to sleep, okay that works, and then here, instead of using Thunderbolt, I can use Seismic Toss, which actually does a little bit more damage, and plus it has like a cool animation, look, it like turns into a little ball and gets thrown up in the air. I love it. Okay, now it's time for the Executor, and here we see a serious improvement over my play last time. If I put it to sleep, Seismic Toss is able to take this thing out in 4 hits. That is much better than the like 8 or 9 hits that it took before. I put Magneton to sleep, it wakes up, I put it back to sleep, and then I'm able to knock it out. Okay, so Thunderbolt knocks the Cloister out, and then I use Thunderbolt 3 times against the Flareon, taking it down as well. Gengar clocks in with a time under 40 minutes. 39 minutes and 22 seconds, with two resets at level 59. All of this took 2 hours and 32 minutes of game time. Okay, so it's time to announce our winner. Obviously, Pokemon Red was much easier for Gengar. Just the fact that Gengar has to rely on Hypnosis much more in Pokemon Yellow to avoid Paralysis makes it so much less consistent. In only two playthroughs of Pokemon Red, a game that I haven't been playing very regularly, I was able to get exceptional results under 40 minutes. So now it's time for me to make a confession about my Pokemon Yellow Gengar playthroughs. <laughs> um, yeah, so I did two playthroughs in Pokemon Red, and I got a 38 minute time. With Gengar in Yellow, I did my original playthrough, Gengar vs. Alakazam, that's like a year and a half old now. And then I did a follow-up playthrough to that race, which I never actually published on the channel. And then following that, I completed five Gengar playthroughs, trying to improve its time. And then for this video, I did three more playthroughs with Gengar to finally get its time under 40 minutes. So in two playthroughs with Pokemon Red, I was able to get a 38 minute time. And in 10 playthroughs of Pokemon Yellow, I was able to get a 39 minute time. I think it is quite clear to me at this point that Pokemon Yellow is significantly harder for Gengar. However, it is able to get very close results, but I don't think that I could get a 39 minute time every time I did this playthrough, just because of the reliance on a move like Hypnosis, which is, as we all know, trash. Like, subscribe, ring the Chimeco and comment because I gotta read them all. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, thank you so much, it means the world to me. If you made it this far, you're incredible. Happy Halloween weekend, everyone. Hope you've had a good one. I'll see you in my Halloween special tomorrow.